What is the connection between Palestinian solidarity and universal values? Welcome to Connections, the Arab Studies Institute's interview program. I'm Muin Rabbani, and for this episode, we're delighted to be speaking with Zahi Zalua. Zahi Zalua is the Cushing Eels Professor of Philosophy and Literature at Whitman College in Washington State and editor of The Comparatist. The author of numerous books, his most recent, Solidarity in the Palestinian Cause, Indigeneity, Blackness, and the Promise of Universality, is published by Bloomsbury this year. Zahi Zalua, it's a real pleasure to welcome you to Connections. Thank you, Moen. Um, your book emphasizes that Palestine is ultimately a, a global cause that does or should concern people everywhere rather than a specifically Palestinian or Arab cause. Why do you see Palestine as, in a sense, the ultimate global cause of the 21st century? I mean, for me, I take my inspiration from Edward Said's motto, equality or nothing. Mm -hmm. And then he quickly follows up the equality or nothing for Arabs and Jews. So he makes the value of equality a universal principle, axiomatic for any vision of justice. So it is fundamentally open to all. So that's the force of the Saidian vision of equality as a universalist principle that I wanted to kind of cultivate in this book, juxtaposing his intervention with the changing field of race studies, in part influenced by critical black studies, significant reflections on what it means to be human and what is a human premised on, which for many, for many scholars in that field is fundamentally anti-blackness. So any gesture to humanism, where Said often is folded into a kind of a humanist vision, has to confront the horrible history of humanism and its anti-blackness. So I wanted to engage that field um, to, or, to be able to articulate what is universal about the Palestinian cause. The second um, field of influence on me is, was critical indigenous studies and how it makes the question of land and sovereignty primary. So it's no longer the model of inclusion versus exclusion. You're actually claiming land sovereignty is a point of departure. So I wanted both of these fields to be in dialogue with one another through the Palestinian question, through the Palestinian cause as a kind of articulation of what follows from thematizing the Palestinian condition. So for me, you know, take the chance, um, Palestinian lives matter. What does that mean? Is it a particularist demand? Recognize my identity, right? Translate it into what is good for me, what is in my interest? Or does it follow what I think is the most revolutionary aspect of Black Lives Matter to the extent that it's not about my life, my Black life, it's about everybody's life. Mm -hmm. So when you hear the chant Black Lives Matter, you're really not looking for inclusion or recognition from a racist state. You're saying, hey, white America, you have a problem. Acknowledge your anti-Blackness, come to terms with my Black humanity. Same thing with the Palestinian Lives Matter chant. It says, hey, Tel Aviv, you have a problem. Recognize your settler history and reality. Recognize your complicity in the, in the ongoing Nakba. So by seeing Palestinian Lives Matter as a kind of universal chant, it blocks certain visions of indigeneity as particularists. It translates the force of that movement as a universal framework for thinking justice, thinking land, thinking um, resistance to a general logic of dispossession, right? There is no real, you can't really fight a cause today unless you globalize your struggle. And how do you globalize your struggle? Do you make deals with various marginalized groups or you actually sh fight for a bold vision, right? The way Fanon imagined a new human emerging out of decolonization. That project has not been fulfilled. And I think the Palestinian cause is one way to articulate um, what is at stake in the world. Um, you referenced Edward Said, and of course he famously put forward the view 
that Palestine has become the litmus test um, for those claiming to be progressive or claiming to endorse universal values, because um, I'm sure you're familiar with the um, with the phenomenon of the PPPs or PEPs rather, progressive except for Palestine. So, how do you see, um, given what you've said about universal values and and so on, fitting into that uh, litmus test? Where where is that litmus test today? I mean, the litmus test is a kind of is a Western fantasy, right? In the two state solution, in a sense one can change your attitudes, one's attitude slightly and says, okay, the Palestinians have been abused, right? Um, and we need perhaps a different prime minister in Israel, right? You know, so liberals love to hate Netanyahu, mm -hmm. right? By the way, I hate Netanyahu, right? So he's a monster, he's a war criminal, but Netanyahu is not the problem. Israel as a colonial state is the problem. So this distinction between liberal Zionism, political religious Zionism, is a distinction without substance. So- A distinction but, without a difference. Absolutely, absolutely. So in the book, I talk about, you know, occupation on cruise control, which is the kind of liberal Zionist approach, or occupation on steroids. Which one is worse? Okay, one can say, you know, you, you, you see the brutality, of Netanyahu and his right-wing cabinet, and they're, make, they're accelerating the elimination of Palestinians. The liberal Zionists does something very similar, but at a slower level, which is often not noticed by Western media and Western powers. So here, rather than align your forces with, you know what, we need more liberal Zionists as prime ministers, we need to encourage this other vision of Zionism. No, no, I mean, historically we've seen every single prime minister, regardless of their background, have focused on the elimination of Palestinians one way or another. And you might point out that Zionism historically has been the project of the Zionist labor movement rather than, um, at least until recent decades, of the revisionist movement. Absolutely. I mean, so, I mean, in the book, I try to give multiple layers of Zionism. And, you know, Said himself kind of resisted Zionism is racism, even though he documented how racist its practices were and are. He wanted to, he was worried about dehistoricizing Zionism. He wanted to link it to a historical movement, to a certain kind of appeal, certain kind of passion, as Jacqueline Rose kind of formulates, a passion for Zion. So you have Zionism that sold itself, right, as a liberation project, right, protecting Jews against anti-Semitism, Semitism, um, <clears throat> and you can see the appeal to block anti-Semitic ideologies. Safeguarding Jews is a great appeal for all Jews in the world and people who support Jews, the life of Jews. But this anti-Semitic cover starts to weaken when you look at Zionism as, a, as, a, as an ideology that has fueled settler colonialism and as a collective fantasy. As a nationalist movement, effectively. Absolutely, I mean, so the settler colonial movement is a nationalist movement, but, that, but, but I'm also interested in the way um, Zionism functions as a collective fantasy, right? Teaches Jews who to desire, who to identify with and what to hate. <clears throat> and any critique of Zionism has to confront its ideological face, but also its collective fantasy and its appeal. How do you disrupt that? How you disidentify with Israel, which many Jews around the world are starting to do, uh, which scares greatly Western powers and Israeli leaders. But I, I would like to come back to um the proposition put forward by Edward Said that um, your position on Palestine in effect functions as a litmus test for your genuine or false adherence sure. to progressive and yeah. universal values. I'd, I'd like you um, to explore 
that position a little further before we turn to um, issues such as um, indigeneity and critical sure. black studies? I mean, you have to be consistent. Mm -hmm. If you're gonna argue for a principle of justice, you have to apply it to the Palestinians. I mean, there's no greater hypocrisy of, you know, if Said was alive today, you look at, look at Ukraine. You can see Ukraine as in, you know, engaging, engaging in, in, a, in a model of resistance to occupation, foreign occupation, illegal occupation. They're seen as freedom fighters. What prevents you from seeing Palestinians as freedom fighters? And intellectuals have to come to terms with what provokes that resistance. Guilt over the Shoah? What is preventing an embrace of the Palestinian cause, right? Um, so I think, you know, Saeed's legacy is to demystify and call out the hypocrisy of intellectuals who- Well, you, 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 yeah. you suggested that guilt over the Holocaust plays an important part. Um, that at least has a relationship to um, principle in one way or another. Isn't yeah. perhaps the more persuasive argument that it has everything to do with opportunism, about um, not obstructing career prospects, um, about keeping your head down when it matters? I mean, being labeled anti-Semitic is devastating, right? And I think if you, if you evoke any kind of sympathy, even if you retweet the image of Palestinian solidarity, I stand with the suffering, um, I stand with, with, with Palestinians who suffer. I think it is a bad thing. That is anti-Semitic today, right? Because in a sense, you posit the Israeli government, Israeli uh, soldiers as the victimizers of Palestinians. That commits you to an anti-Semitic label. And a lot of intellectuals, no, they want to avoid this. They can teach a course about injustice in the world and suspend Palestine. Or it's a conflict. You know, both sides have this kind of both sidism is at play. This is how liberal you could get. But I think to be progressive here is to utter the word settler colonialism, not resist it, not try to, I mean, even apartheid logic has its limits because the apartheid model still believes in kind of racial segregation and the solution is inclusion into the system, full equality. What does it mean to have full equality under Israel model of Jewish and democratic um, state? There's no equality. There's no possibility of an equality under that system, under that regime, the Zionist regime. So Said wanted, you know, pushed intellectuals to to be coherent and not hypocrites. Um. I'd, I'd like to turn now about the role of critical black studies and the development of your thinking about, um, about the Palestinian cause. Um, can you explain please the, how one led you to the other or, or the relationship um, uh, and the symbiosis you see between the two? Yeah, yeah. So in part, it was the kind of black, black Palestinian solidarity that emerged, right? Uh, you had Palestinian activists supporting the riots in Ferguson, the protests in Ferguson for black lives. And at the same time, Black Lives Matter activists were laying the support for Palestinians, visiting Palestinians, reviving a certain kind of black Palestinian solidarity. So that was exciting for me because it was a kind of model where, okay, Palestinians joining uh, Black Lives Matter is not exactly the best move for a kind of profile if, you're, if the world is anti-Black. Putting your lot with a Black cause may not be to your immediate advantage. Same thing with Black Lives Matter. Aligning yourself with Palestinians will get you the automatic label of anti-Semitic. No. They said, these are causes that we believe in. What is good for me is good for my Palestinian brethren. Um, and I think that was very optimistic, right? Um, I bent more towards a kind of pessimistic wing. Um, this is why I'm also attracted by Afro-pessimism within critical black studies. Um, 
who are very critical of easy solidarity movements. Um, but I think they take it to an extreme. They ultimately argue for kind of separatist model. So what I want to keep from the Afro-pessimist wing of critical black studies is a deep reflection on the human. How do you understand the human? You can't just say, recognize my humanity. Mm -hmm. But if you're Palestinian arguing for Black Lives Matter, the humanist framework is no longer adequate, no longer sufficient. You have to go beyond affirming the human. You have to scrutinize the history of the human and its anti-Blackness. And you have, you have to scrutinize your own history of anti-Blackness, right? The Palestinian communities have to see how they've been complicit in this anti-Black world, either implicitly or explicitly. So I think to, sh to, to demonstrate to Black activists that, you know, we're serious about joining your movement. We're not just taking your energy of protest and using it for ourselves. We're not just cannibalizing your cause. We're fully committed to your cause. Um, that's, that's the aspect of... Um, and what, is, how does that, what does that mean in practice? In practice means you decline the rewards the system affords you unless everybody, I don't want to say benefits, but everybody's cause in a sense is, is recognized. So there's no kind of fragmentation. There's no bribery here to believe, again, equality or nothing. If, if you know, black activists get a break, get more funding for communities, but you know what? Tone down the pro-Palestinian language. Just please, you know, take it easy there. No, right? I, mean, I think you would have to say no to that. Mm -hmm. um, Palestinians have hardly any leverage. I mean, they, they, it's not like they're gonna be bribed. Um, they're definitely more vulnerable under Western eyes. Um, so here you can have, you know, companies, Google, Facebook, Nike, show their support for black lives. They're not gonna do that for Palestinians, right? Um, yeah. um, one theme that is prominent throughout your book is, is the importance of the framework of settler colonialism. Yeah. Um, not only to understanding reality in, in Palestine, but also for thinking about how to move um, uh, forward. Let me start with the question, is, isn't settler colonialism simply a descriptive term? Um, and why do you consider it um, of such importance to analysis and prescription? I mean, <laughs> It is a descriptive term, but it is what has been ideologically bracketed, effaced, right? So it's not, it doesn't enter mainstream discourse, right? So the fact that you're stressing the framework of settler colonialism is precisely a way to shift the discussion from land conflict over land, right? It's not as if there are two people living next to each other having, you know, border issues. There's a historical condition that provoked this crisis and you have to name it such, right? So you have, you know, so-called leftist critics like Celia bin Habib basically says, you know, you're not gonna get far by accusing the other person of engaging in settled colonialism. But this is for me, intellectual cowardice, right? To the extent that you're, you wanna make the racist not feel too bad. Mm -hmm. Right, so you have to use language that uh, that appeases the oppressor, and you have to call it what it is. Mm -hmm. By calling it what it is, you move the direction away from conflict, and you start focusing on on antagonisms. How do you resolve antagonisms? The system itself is incapable of resolving antagonism and remain and remain the system that it is. Right? Mm -hmm. To actually deal with the antagonism, the whole system has to change, which is another word for decolonization. Right? Yeah. To decolonize Israel means not, to, not only to see it as an apartheid state, but as a settler state. Mm -hmm. And some people would respond by saying, um, you know, this is a very well-established position. You had Maxime uh, Rodinson in the 1960s. Yeah 
already devoting an entire book to the argument that Israel is, um, in his words, a colonial settler state. You had, of course, uh, the recently deceased Elia Zorek um, in, in a book about Israel within the Green Line, characterizing it as a, a case study in internal colonialism. And throughout um, uh, the decades, the, the position that Israel needs to be understood as a form of settler colonialism um, uh, within the same framework as other settler colonies, um, whether established by the British, the French, um, or, or others. So why do you think, um, I mean, is this a framework that has fallen into abeyance in recent years and needs to be revived? Um, why do you think its emphasis is so important? Because it hasn't gained the recognition at the mainstream level. Mm -hmm. Politicians, less than Western politicians don't evoke it. You have a new generation of Democrats, right? In the US, Canada, that are articulating a settled colonial lens. They're seeing the Palestinian cause through a settled colonial lens. This is absent. This hasn't been elevated to the level of public debate. The fact that we're stressing it now, we're still stressing it, is to sustain the pressure on, on politicians and, in a sense, educating people about what's going on there. Because what? How many people read academic books? They see, they consume mainstream media. And mainstream media, when it is tough on Israel, it's always about the, you know favoring the two-state solution. So... And I think you would agree that the two-state solution is still right, the kind of narrative that makes liberals in the Western world happy. And I mean, Tom Friedman, right? I mean, recently has made the two-state solution aspirational, which is maddening, right? I mean, we've seen how the two-state solution has bracketed any kind of anti-colonial framework. And it has proved disastrous for Palestinians with the increase in illegal settlements, the, you know, the ongoing elimination of Palestinians. So to insist on settled colonialism is to insist on the anti-colonial resistance to Israel. That, that, to part, that part I understand, yeah. but, but you're also saying that it's important to get um, leading politicians and, and world leaders yeah to accept this framework. And yeah. in response, yeah. I would argue, if you look at Algeria, if you look at Zimbabwe, if you look at Angola and Mozambique and a host of other cases, um, you know, very, very few in positions of power ever accepted that these were cases of settler colonialism, even though factually and substantively they were, and that didn't prevent their ultimate liberation. So, I mean, so the question here, do we accept mainstream narrative? We just accept, you know. Well, the, the, I, I think it's, it's not so much about accepting mainstream yeah. narratives, but um, if, if that is our narrative, yeah. um, where, is, where is the political importance of having it adopted um, uh, by, by those in power when you have a whole host of cases yeah. where, where they didn't and their refusal to adopt this framework ultimately was unable to um, obstruct um, uh, the liberation of those settler colonies. I mean, I think you have a narrative where things are changing. Mm -hmm. Younger generations are seeing it. These, these younger people are gonna grow up and they're gonna seek positions of power. So I think there is a changing attitude, there's a changing mentality over the Palestinian question. And in part, it's due to BDS. It's, in part, it's due to scholars having the courage to write books that denounce Israel and its occupation. And through social media, you're actually seeing the brutality of Israel. Mm -hmm. You need a framework to articulate that brutality. Um, and, you know, the, the idea that Palestinians are indigenous to the land is still resisted left and right. 
Mm -hmm. right? They're Arabs. They're not even Palestinians. Palestinian people don't they have exist. 22 countries. The Jews have only one and so yeah. on. Yeah. yeah. But, um, but isn't your isn't your argument really for the promotion and adoption of this framework by the intelligentsia and by activist circles rather than um, politicians and political leaders per se, if I understand you correctly. I mean, I think you need to exert pressure. I mean, for example, right, what happened to South Africa, mm -hmm. right? And since you have to gain popular, I mean, the, you have to have collective grassroots movements that will exert pressures on politicians and not re-elect them. You know, if Palestine becomes a subject of debates, right, among politicians, then you can start actually scaring politicians. You can't just side comfortably with Israel anymore. You have, right, you have citizens wanting a different face for their politician, a different position for their politicians. So I think it's the grassroots movement is changing the mentality of citizens. I think that's what BDS in a sense is doing. Um, and if you can raise this at the level of what happened to South Africa, it would be successful. Um, part of my critique here is to recognize the settler colonial framework, but also to supplement that, to complement that with a kind of leftist critique of political economy, right? And I think here you can't just imagine a decolonial Palestine that just right, um, releases itself from Western, from Western control, Western domination that delinks from it, um, which is a temptation of a lot of decolonial scholars. I think Palestine has to go through decolonization, right? Palestine, Israel through decolonization. Also, you have to have a robust critique of the political economy that would emerge. So any vision of binationalism, which I share with Said, his vision of, you know, these peoples are, their lives, their histories are entangled with one another. You can't just separate one um, and leave one people. But the, but the binationalism that I support here that builds on Said is not gonna be, we just get along here. It requires a dismantling of the settlements. It requires reparation. It requires a kind of economic justice. So it's not just the Palestinian elite who are going to benefit from this. As has been the case during yes. the Oslo uh, process. Yes. Yeah. yes. So I mean, I think it cannot, so any kind of universal cause here must fight against racial domination, but also economic exploitation, right? I mean, I think this is the this is why it becomes a universal cause because we're not just playing the liberal narrative of fighting against racism and ignoring class struggle. But the two well, are entangled. Given, I mean, you've you've referenced South Africa several times, and given um, that Palestinians, I think, um, you would agree, have a much weaker hand than yeah. the liberation movement in South Africa. If you look at the transition in South Africa, it was effectively um, political equality um was achieved and prolonged uh armed conflict ultimately avoided yeah. by giving guarantees of only minimal changes uh yeah. to the economic structure as it existed in south africa you're now making the case which i think in principle few would disagree with that what what's required in palestine is a fundamental transformation not only in the politics but also in, in the um, economic structure of, of the land. So how, how would you advocate for this, taking into account um, that even achieving what some would say were um, uh, the limited transitional achievements in South Africa, that even right. getting there is going to be so much more difficult in Palestine? Absolutely, but I think that the model here, again, if you see Palestine as a universal cause, mm -hmm. then, it also should help the antagonism at the heart of Israel's culture. And we're seeing the antagonism being manifested here more clearly via the new kind of right-wing um, coalition that is that has taken over. So when you when you connect the antagonisms of different cultures, of different communities, you can have defections, right? In the name of a larger global struggle. So here are workers 
um, workers who were exploited, Ethiopian Jews in Israel, can find more common cause with Palestinians, with many Palestinians struggling for justice, rather than just enjoying a kind of Jewish privilege, which makes you at least better than Palestinians. So I think a vision that taps into class struggle is crucial here to make it a universal movement. You can't bracket political economy. Um, and people like Fanon have been hammering this, hammer this point, right, for 70 years. Um, um, f finally, I'd, I'd like to turn to another um, key issue that you raise in your book. And again, um, uh, if we return to Edward Said, and if we look, for example, at his um, one of his last books, Culture and Imperialism, yeah. it was very much a manifesto, I think, against nativism yeah. um, and against identity politics. In, in, in your most recent books, yeah. um, you also make the important point that solidarity um, needs to go beyond the lure of identity politics. And you then identify identity politics as, as a currency of liberal framework. I, I think you'd be very interested to hear um, uh, your, your, your assessment of, of this entire issue. Yeah, and because I think indigeneity mm -hmm. can be framed around identity politics. In a sense, you want to be recognized. And often is. Yeah, and often is. And because you get rewards for it as well. But when you do that, in a sense, you privilege your identity. By privileging your identity, I think you're limiting the reach of your cause. Because I think your cause has a universal reach, but do you, do you get seduced by recognition? And I think the force of many indigenous scholars today is to block the logic of recognition, right? I think you have that in Coolhart, um, Glenn Coolhart, um, in the Canadian, Canadian context, um, rejecting this kind of politics of recognition, accommodations, and so forth. I think that is very valuable. And he folds his critique um, with capitalism. And it says for, for indigenous to live, capitalism must die, right? And so that vision is, is pretty powerful. The drawback as, as I see it could be is what comes afterwards. There's a kind of retreat into one's own particularity kind of self-sufficient community can be established. I don't think that's possible. I think global capitalism has too far of a reach throughout right, the planet. Um, so one has to resist the lure of withdrawal. You can argue for land sovereignty, but your land sovereignty has to be coupled with a critique of political economy. And how do you resist political economy? It's through a kind of collective struggles. Mm -hmm. And these struggles are gonna face many bumps, right? Right, the charge of anti-Semitism will, preve will prevail in many cases in, in arresting a movement that seeks solidarity with the Palestinians. So the Palestinian cause is a flashpoint. How serious are you in your universality? Um, so. And, and what are the key markers of this universality in your view? I think the key marker is <clears throat> the ability to see the dual but interlocking nature of the struggles against racial domination and economic exploitation. These are the markers. It's a movement has universal force if it's disrupting right, a kind of libidinal economy for what traffics as good, what is phobic, if you're disrupting the libidinal economy, the collective unconscious of people, and you're dealing with class struggle, you're dealing with the political economy, then you increase your chances, right? No movement comes with a guarantee, right? But the movement here to have a chance to win people over, right, has to acknowledge people's problems, not just Palestinian problems, but the Palestinian in a sense is embodying many of the global problems. Right, dispossession, elimination, instrumentalization, the Palestinians have faced it, are facing it. So in a sense, the Palestinians can speak about this radical displacement, but they also have to understand the condition of black folks and anti-blackness and how it drives this world. 
So make um, some use of Ashil Membe's notion of the becoming black of the world, mm -hmm. right? This idea that democracy has shielded Westerners from the, from the devastating impact of capitalism, but that shield is shrinking. Few and fewer are immune from uh, capitalism's devastation. But he also written quite a bit about Gaza and what Gaza signifies, right? The Gazification of the world. So, you know, Membe also sees, you know, Palestine, the condition of blacks as not crudely analogous, but there's overlap. They converge in what is going on at the level of the planetary. Zahiz al author of um, Solidarity and the Palestinian Cause, Indigeneity, Blackness, and the Promise of Universality, which, as I mentioned, is out from uh, Bloomsbury this year. Thank you very much for sharing your insights with Connections. Thanks again. Thank you so much, Moeen.